Today on Poor Hammer, we are going to solve a mystery. What is the worst written codex in 9th edition, and why is the answer Chaos Demons? I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? So, let's do an actual in-depth breakdown of this. Sounds good. Alright, this is going to be a bit of a more negative episode, but if you're looking for something a bit more upbeat, the YouTube channel is always there, and we got some fun orc stuff that's always exciting and fun. Yes, this is not going to be the most upbeat of episodes, so if this is your first time listening to us and you want something more fun, go to any other episode. (laughs) (laughs) So, I have hinted probably in half of the last 10 episodes, that I kind of absolutely hate the Demon Codex. I now have enough games in with the Codex that I can say this from a more experienced point of view as to the problems it has. But I'm going to try to keep this pretty level-headed and objective. Right, and we're going to try and keep away from, like, competitive balance, because those are specifically with, like, points. I mean, that'll come up, like, flamers. But generally, this is more about like how the codex was designed, not what the specific numbers of, you know, the competitive balance is, because there's going to be changes to that, but you can't really change the fundamentals of the codex. You can, as we learned from Necrons. The data slate is a powerful tool. Demons isn't popular enough to get that level of a correct fix. I personally can't wait another five years to see them try again. That's true. That's true. So this codex is a little weird because we got some behind the scenes look. This codex essentially leaked from playtesters before it actually was previewed. And they had a very accurate playtest version of the codex that did have differences from the final version. So we could kind of see what happened between playtesting and release. Right. Because they got way too many things right to just be making this up. But in that rumor thing, there is the fact that we know in 8th edition we used to have rules if you did a full detachment of Nurgle or of Korn, etc. Right. It was a loci, which was like a army rule, but it was only in an aura. It's not great, but it was something, and you'd like to see it fixed in the full version, it'd just be a normal sub-faction rule. We used to have an ability for each god on the data sheet. All of those are gone. So, like, we lost what used to be called Disgustingly Resilient, which was on all the Nurgle data sheets, and then Death Guard stole them, and then Death Guard made it into something else, and then we lost them. <laughs> yeah. There were equivalents for everybody. So, all of that's gone. It's not in this book. Honestly, I feel like there were some good ideas, and then they had to smash all of this in one codex when they're like four separate things that work well together or are supposed to be able to work well together. Fundamentally, there aren't really enough units for each to give a full codex. And that gets into why I've pushed 100% for going the AOS route. We should have Codex Zinch, which includes Thousand Suns, these Demons, Zongor. It needs to be a thing in 10th, because the way this codex is written right now doesn't fucking work. No. The army is not an army. It's four armies that are forced to work together, but have no benefit for doing anything on their own using a subset. They get basically nothing for working together other than you just get to play good stuff. Which is quite unhealthy. Not only like balance wise, but also just like not fun. It does kind of remind me of the Eldari Codex with Harlequins. Harlequins, I get that there's not enough units, but they're not the same as the rest of that Codex. Yeah, so let's compare two Harlequins for a second to talk about like how glaringly obvious the lack of rules is. Yeah. So Harlequins has six units that are not HQs and are not a fortification. The reason we're nixing HQs on this is because the demon armies are exceptionally old and have like a hundred named characters and have the weirdo ancient captain equivalent on foot, on bike equivalent, on larger vehicle equivalent. So we get rid of all the bloat that doesn't matter because one unit in a list is like that. So, Harlequins has six units outside of HQs and fortifications. Corn has four. Nurgle has four. 
Zinch has six, Slanesh has six. Pretty much on par. Yeah. When you split up the Drukari Codex, by the way, you ended up with very similar numbers between the three subsections of Drukari. And then Undivided has one extra unit that's not an HQ, which is just the Soul Grinder. Which, yeah, I mean, those numbers, realistically, there's not enough for a separate codex. No, which, again, is why I say next edition, when we get Emperor's Children, if we follow the pattern of three editions in a row, (laughs) we'll get Emperor's Children. And when we do, then we can finally split these damn books up. Let's continue. There's no detachment ability given statically in either of these armies. Just to explain that to you, in certain sub-armies of a larger faction, like Thousand Sons or Grey Knights. They have a single thing, which is uh, Brotherhood of Sorcerers or Aegis for Grey Knights. It's your, this is your army ability. You don't get an army ability from your sub-faction because you already kind of are one. Right. So we don't have that. Both armies are the same. Harlequins does, however, end up with the choose your sub-faction option instead. That line is missing from demons. In fact, for demons, what you get is you gain your HQ army construction rules. You get obsec for all your troops other than nerglings, also other than blue horrors. But for blue horrors, they get obsec, but their data sheet removes the obsec. That's not confusing at all. This is a well-written codex, Eric. Well-written. Yeah. Then you get your souping rules because this is a souping army. Same as harlequins. And for some reason, where everyone else would get, like, their sub-faction rules, you get a reminder that you get a relic if you have a warlord, which I'm pretty sure, after looking at several of my codices I had sitting here, is because without sub-factions, you don't have the reminder text of how you get a relic. Okay. So I think they had to throw that rule in here. Very strange. That's the only reason I can see this being here. I was going to say, like, maybe they were planning on some other rule changes or something like that. But maybe, yeah, I don't know. Weird. But then moving on from the detachment abilities, we get into the data sheet abilities. Now, data sheet abilities are essentially army-wide. They allow the exception cases to occur. But we consider them army-wide rules for the most part. In these small armies, it's definitely the case. Right. So with demons, you get demonic which is actually a summation of their four abilities. I actually will give demons a minor point that having one ability that says, hey, this ability is these four sub rules, and then you just have one ability written on every data sheet is a little bit cleaner than the Harlequin's way of writing out three. So Demonic gets broken down into its sub rules that have equivalents in Harlequin's for the most part. You have demon saves, which Harlequins have. Harlequins panoply, which is a great word in the English language we didn't just Google. (laughs) Yeah, definitely knew that one completely. So where demons have their demonic save, Harlequins get an ability that gives them a four-up invuln army-wide. They ignore terrain and models when they move, charge, all that jazz. Yeah. And they get minus one to be hit. That's all the one ability for Harlequins. Demons is just, you have demonic saves, here's how they work. Right. They're pretty equal, if I'm not memeing on the fact that one has three abilities, including a minus one to be hit built in. Similar style. Demons then have Manifestation. Manifestation is your deep strike rules. It gives everything in your army the ability to deep strike in the first place without CP, which is great. Yeah. And you can deep strike closer, depending on some sub rules. Harlequins have their advance and charge ability and fallback shoot and charge ability here. Yeah. They're about on par. Deep Strike is very strong. It's a lot harder to play with, but you get the point. And the combo of how the Deep Strike works of Manifestation with Demonic Terror because it has that leadership thing. It actually is interesting. I'm not entirely sure how I would rate it on being a clean rule, but... Yeah, versus just advance and charge and then fall back, shoot and charge. Yeah, but at the same time, like, I can't fault the demon codex for having some weird interactions. I don't hate weird interactions for something that's from the chaos. Yes. I hate things that don't make sense and argue with each other. (laughs) And then finally, the last thing they both give. This is what I consider... A turn ability, it's your equivalent to doctrines in Space Marines, use the vanilla ice cream standard. Okay. 
your tides of the warp if you're a gray knight yeah yeah, yeah. okay my cabal points if i'm a thousand suns the drukari power from pain table anything that's like the battle round ability yeah so for demons you get warp storm which i won't say a word on right now and for harlequins you get luck of the laughing god which even after the most insane nerf i've ever seen is a much better ability yeah but they are both that ability right so the point is we are rules wise at parity with harlequins other than the fact that we are clearly missing rules that a sub faction would give which come with static abilities where harlequins have those and you know extra warlord trade extra relic all that jazz now here comes the reason for that rumor is from the leakers who were playtesters at one point we did have the nurgle rule the zinch rule the corn rule and the slanesh rule they were all emergency ripped out of the codex because they found in last second in playtesting, if you spammed like 120 plague bears with disgusting resilience and two wounds, it broke the meta and made for toxic lists. And they didn't want to have to add rule of three to the game for troops to make the codex not broken. That would sound miserable to play against. Honestly, it would sound miserable to play. I actually don't see the issue in real life because no one plays with two damage shooting anymore because DR exists in like every fucking army. Yeah. But we'll never know the truth of it unless GW wants to, you know. Unlikely. So moving on from the clearly missing abilities, let's talk about another elephant in the room, which is the word core, the entire mechanic of 9th edition. GW has made such a mess of core. It had the ability to be interesting and to have good play patterns, but it didn't work and they didn't follow through with it at all. So Core, as a thing of 9th edition, is a good attempt that had horrendous execution. Let's just use Corn as an example. Guess, out of the stratagems, how many of them are for Core Corn, Demon, Core Corn, whatever? Probably one or two for corn, because like I think corn would have more core kind of things than like a Zeech or something like that. Like Zeech would probably have less, maybe zero or one, corn one or two, something like that. The words Legiones, Demonica, Corn, Core appear zero times in stratagems. Okay. Would you like to figure out how many relics talk about giving something to the core units nearby, stuff like that? Uh, one. Zero. Would you like to guess the Exalted Bloodthirsters, if there's any exaltations that give you core stuff for your local units? I feel like I see a pattern, so I'm going to go with zero. Nailed it. How about okay. Warlord traits? How many <laughs> Warlord traits are giving off an aura to Legiones Demonica Core Corn? Is it zero? It's one. Ooh, hey, we found one. Okay. How about auras? There's got to be at least one aura. Like, that's what core is used for, is auras. There's two. There's the captain aura and the lieutenant aura. Bloodthirsters have the captain. Heralds have the lieutenant. It's that way for every of the four. Okay, good. Because I was like, there's no way they don't have at least one of those captains or lieutenants dealing with core. That would be so fucking stupid. (laughs) So at least they have those two. That's nice. So here's the problem. The heralds have two abilities. One of them is the Lieutenant Aura that you are used to seeing on any Lieutenant equivalent reroll wounds of one, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that is the core thing that you would expect. Right. They have a second ability. The second ability has three names for the same ability. Bloodmaster, Skullmaster, Bloodthrone, named after the Heralds. That's not confusing. But that's also a lie, because Bloodthrown randomly is a 9-inch targeting range, whereas Bloodmaster and Skullmaster are actual identical to each other. So two out of three are identical, one randomly changes the range up a notch, because it's the biggest of the three. That is dumb. Here's the kicker, Eric. This is not Legiones Demonica Corn Core. They subdefine it as Bloodletters Core. Do you want to know how many non-bloodletter core units exist? Uh, probably not many. Flesh hounds. The corn dogs are the only (laughs) non-bloodletter that is core. (laughs) The only bloodletter that's not a character that's not core is the skull cannon. 
Right, that, yeah, okay. So, why do this? There are so many edge cases that you will screw up in this codex because of little gotchas and how they're written that probably weren't done on purpose to fuck with you, the reader. They are probably done on accident because of poor writing. That's not great. And I assume that, like, this was the example of Karn. Same stuff for the others. To, to give you an equivalent, in Zinch, same deal for the most part. However, in Zinch, it gets better. The third of these three identical abilities randomly changes the tag from Horror Core to Screamers. <laughs> Just randomly different. But they're all in generally the same inconsistent, terrible boat. We can move on from the spaghetti that is the keywords and how they're distributed and how Core is functioning in this book. Let's talk about the things that have already been fixed that were problems a few weeks back when I was first ranting. Armor of Scorn was clearly written before demonic saves existed. Demonic saves cannot be altered in any way. Armor of Scorn used to give, each time an attack with damage characteristic of one was allocated to the bearer, you could add one to the saving throw. Cool. I'm glad I can't change my demonic saving throws in any way. Yeah. So obviously <laughs> that had to get FAQ'd to say, even though it's a demonic saving throw, so that the relic didn't do literal zero. Yeah, and wow, is that messy and embarrassing on the way it was, like, fixed. <laughs> and while we're on the topic, I want to give a shout out to one of your armies. I like demonic saves. I do not like that Grey Knight's Codex was clearly <laughs> written when demons didn't have demonic saves. <laughs> yeah, those uh, demon-oriented and specific killing machines that are Grey Knight's. Don't do particularly well. <laughs> What's the name of Kaldor Drago's warlord trade, Eric? The one that he always has. Yeah, Kaldor Drago's warlord trade would be a demon slayer. And how good is that at slaying demons with demonic saves, Eric? Well, it does say that each time his warlord makes a melee attack against a demon unit, invulnerable save throws cannot be made against that attack. So fucking awful. Fascinating. So, obviously, the correct thing is for that to say demonic saves, but it has not been FAQ'd yet. No, it hasn't. <laughs> Which, I honestly, I expected it to happen on this last one. So did everyone else. <laughs> I don't care that much. It's just dumb. I care a lot, because that's bullshit. Yeah. That is a fail between codicy rules, where one codex was clearly expecting the other codex to come out with a rule, and it didn't. You update that. That's exactly what errata is for. It is exactly what errata is for. And it should be done. All right, so let's move into the Warp Storm table. I have my book open to the Warp Storm page to talk about the worst mechanic ever made. Let's hear what you have to say, because I don't think that's true. Warp Storm is a super fun mechanic. Imagine if your army rule just didn't work some turns. So let's break it down a bit. This is going to require us to talk a bit about Warp Storm abilities. To define what a Warp Storm effect is, first of all, at the beginning of every battle round, you roll eight dice. Why? Because lol, I'm so random, it's funny, chaos, haha. -ha. So instead of, you know, playing the Imperium and just getting your fucking ability, you have to do the chaotic thing and roll dice to figure out if your faction functions. You roll some dice. You get Warp Storm points based off of how many of them rolled a 4-up. Everyone who's ever had to roll 4-ups knows how this is going to go. In our two games this weekend, there was an entire game where I never used a Warp Storm ability. Nice. At multiple points in the game, I had 2 to 3 Warp Storm points that happened. But when you read the 2 and 3 Warp Storm point effects, you will laugh at how niche all of them but one are. And of course, I played against a non-shooting army, so the only one that would have been good out of all of those doesn't work against non-shooting armies. Yeah, that's fair. So it was very awkward to watch as I got to do literally nothing over the course of the game with my only army-wide rule. So it's tough because like, I agree with you. As it's written, it is very underwhelming. Even when you're able to take advantage of it, you're not really getting as much as you would expect out of it. And the real problem comes in like, let's talk about the only bonus for running a single faction. If you run a corn detachment, you get an extra three things that you can spend your warp storm points on. Same with Nurgle, Zinch, and Slanesh. Right. Slanesh lost fight first. 
as their army-wide rule. You can pay a whopping four warp storm points, your entire turn's worth on average, 50% of turns you won't even be able to turn the fucker on. Yeah. You can pay all of your turn ability to get back your old static ability. Not counting the loci ability, which was advance and charge. That's just fucking deleted. And I think that that's where, to me, I feel like Warp Storm is interesting, but it needs tweaks that can be fixed. We need to make it so that some of these fundamental ones don't cost as much. And it needs to not deplete after each round. You need to be able to build it up. Yeah. And then we get into, like, the core Nurgle Zinch Slanesh one. Here's the spoiler alert. Uh, you're going to spam Descending Shadow over and over again because it's the only thing that's worth three Warp Storm points and the other stuff is super overpriced to ever be used or is just wholly unreliable to like find a use case for if it's cheap. Yeah, like I said, like I still think that there are ways to balance this into usability. I get where your rant is coming from. I'm understanding more of the fact that like Warp Storm is not well done. No. It has issues upon issues that compound into making it even worse. And I can accept that. Dark Invigoration is on here, which is five Warp Storm points. So, not happening. Not really, no. You have to get lucky to have this happen in the first place, and then when I read it to you, you'll understand more. Use this effect at the start of your morale phase. One model in each Legiones Demonica unit from your army can regain up to D3 lost wounds. If every model in that unit has a wounds characteristic of 1, that unit can instead be replenished. When a unit is replenished, you can return D3 destroyed models to that unit with their full wounds remaining. Each return model no longer counts as having been destroyed for the purposes of morale tests this turn. Each unit can only be replenished once per turn, which is kind of weird, because I guess maybe there's some way you could have gotten 10 Warp Storm points in a turn and done this twice, and they were super afraid of that being busted. Even though you only roll 8 dice, and yes, I know there's a couple ways you could store dice for next turn, but dear god. This gets into the whole problem GW has where on bad napkin math, this ability sounds busted. Oh my god, you could get back like a hundred points of models. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is you have to be at a stage where you have weakened but not dead units. Necron players are all nodding along here, dying inside. <laughs> reanimation protocol. Yeah, how do you like reanimation protocols, my fellow Necron homies? Fantastic, <laughs> right? Great mechanic. Yeah. Not overpricing half our units for an entire edition at all nah just kill them dead then they don't get back up so you have to be at a point where you have partially wounded units so that you can recover from this on the same turn that you rolled five out of eight four ups yeah it only happens at morale so you can't do it as like an emergency button between attacks right this is like literally you have to know going in that you're going to do this and your opponent can see that you're capable of doing this and is just going to beat your head in. This is five warp storm points. It is essentially a non-rule. Especially because once you realize that like you haven't used your warp storm points until like past shooting, it's like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> like it just becomes very obvious what's actually trying to be done. And at that cost doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so here's the one that gave me a stroke. Earlier this morning when we were trying to figure out show notes, and I was telling you some example stuff, I told you a lie. I said Deluge of Fire is one I wrote down when we were playing over the weekend while you weren't there as a completely pointless thing on this table. Deluge of Fire is four Warp Storm points for use this effect at the start of your shooting phase until end of phase, improve the ballistics characteristic of Legiones Demonica Zeech models from your army by one. And I said, this is stupid, here's why. Flamers auto-hit. Yep. Yeah. Screamers don't even have shooting. Yep, they're a melee unit. Okay. And characters hit on twos. That's what you did say. I remember that, yeah. And I was like, okay, I guess that all makes sense. In 8th edition, I cracked out my old codex. My characters hit on twos. In ninth edition, they nerfed the Zinch ones so they hit on threes. Hell yeah, boy. My bloodthirster <laughs> is better at shooting. My fucking bloodthirster is a better shooting HQ than my fucking Lord of Change. Because they wanted to add this stupid waste of warp storm points. But it's only like two warp storm points, right? Four. 
Nice. It's so stupid. I was so angry because I cheated in the game, obviously, because I was rolling my Lord of Change like it hit on twos because Lord of Change hit on twos. That's a bit ridiculous for it to hit on threes. Yeah. 300 point what? model that only shoots and does psychic hits on threes. <laughs> I'm so mad because uh, if it hit like it should, this would only affect your horrors and no one cares because horror shooting is hilariously bad. So instead, we just made Lord of Change hit on threes. Hey, there you go. That's a reason to use it. Wow, fun. So, Warp Storm <laughs> is the worst mechanic in ninth edition. Let's move to stratagems. Yeah, those are pretty important, aren't they? Zinch has eight stratagems. Four out of eight of those stratagems are mono data sheet, meaning they only work on a single model. Nice. These are the worst types of stratagems. When we talk about stratagem bloat, And we're like, there should not be 45 stratagems here. These are the ones you cut. Yeah, and you you roll them into the data sheet. Yeah, that's not great. Zinch isn't alone. Nurgle has eight stratagems. Okay. Two of them are one unit each. I'm counting Slime Trail as one unit. I know a named character is attached as well, but fuck you. Slanesh, good job. None of them are mono data sheet. Please clap. Corn. Has no mono data sheet strats, no stupid thing like that. Out of their six stratagems. This is the only codex in the game they decided to pull back on stratagems on. Yeah. Like, each of these should have 40 stratagems like every other codex. It seems so weird to me that Zeech wouldn't have more, right? Like, You think the super techie god of master plans should have better stratagems? Not only should there be better, but it should be more. And like, it's fine if they're more specific because you have all of these options kind of thing. Like that makes sense for Zeech. Whereas like Nurgle, do we really need that many? So of all these strats, the one I'm not mentioning is every one of them has an extra relic strat because there's no generic stratagem. Okay. We don't have generic strats. So extra relic is four out of these strats that are in the book. We have extra relic four times. Extra warlord trade, just they forgot. We don't have extra warlord traits. You can't take a second one. Really? Which makes the warlord trade section real easy. Why did you print six of them for everybody when you're only going to take one? Because there are clear winners. You can only take one? You can only take one warlord trait in a demon army. You can never get a second one. That's so fucking weird. And they're so lopsided in power level with, like, absolute toys you would never pick other than as, like, a, hey, I like this toy, like, when I do a custom build on a character or something. There's just, like, no reason for four to five of Warlord traits in each section to exist. I did not know that. That sucks, dude. So let's move into spells or the lack thereof. Hello, I play Zinch. I like playing Zinch. I'm here because I like the magic. I like the god of magic. I like the spoopy spells. I like playing Hero Hammer. I enjoy that. That's what I want when I pick an army. Zinch, the god of magic, not the like fractional part of him that plays around with the space marines. The (laughs) core part of Zinch's army. The force of the god of deception, the god of change, the god of magic, all that. Six spells. (laughs) Two of them are mortal wounds. It's pathetic. It honestly is. One of them is so I can move unspent Warp Storm points to my next turn. We talked about the Warp Storm. I'm never going to use that one. Yeah, the Zeech spells suck. Like a Grey Knight player, my spells are pretty decent. But like, I have some envy towards your Thousand Sun spells. Sure, we've got 18 of them. I have no envy towards Zeech. You suck. It's basically renamed Thousand Sun or Grey Knight equivalent spells. And we only get six of them. Yeah boring as fuck i could do this from the viewpoint of every one of the four factions but i am a zinch player at heart i see the problems with zinch the most i'm aware in this book nurgle is fucking unplayable it's horrendous right because he doesn't get his like actual defensive nonsense yeah there is no point to playing an army dedicated to nurgle it's horrendous in the book if everything costs 25 percent less points it'd be playable Slanesh lost what Slanesh was. Slanesh lost all the speed. It's white scars without advance and charge. What's the point? Why are you playing it? You're not. (laughs) Honestly, you're just not. 
So let's move into the actual final section here of data sheets and units, and we'll get to the 25 point elephant in the room. So there's a lot of problems in data sheets here. I'm going to try to keep this brief. In general, there's no war gear or points upgrades or anything you can do. And right. most of your units are static in size. Like you can only ever have 10 horrors. It's not 10 to 20 anymore. You can only ever have a squad of exactly 10 blood letters. I have no idea why. That honestly confused me. I assumed I had read it wrong when I was originally perusing through this. I was like, that's insane. They didn't do that for nerglings though, did they? You would only take a minimum squad size. Like that's the point of them is to be cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was just one of those like, I vaguely remember seeing that, like, Nurglings was, like, the one that they didn't do this with. Nurglings still have variable size. They've just been nerfed 30 other ways so that they're not the default unit you would take. They're basically unplayable, so why do you care? Which is funny to me. They made the mascot, in my opinion, of Nurgle, like, the thing you sell a plushie of. Oh, yeah. You made your own mascot bad. Uh, Nurgle, in general... None of these data sheets have defensive stuff on them. Spoilers. Nurgle is bad. And I'm aware Slanesh is flavorless. So Corn is actually okay on this front, in my opinion. Corn is the closest of the four to being good. If you're a Corn player, you're probably thinking that everyone else is complaining and you're just weirded out by the fact you can't take an extra Warlord trait. Even then, I feel like you're kind of like, I could use a little bit of a buff and it'd be nice. The Corn part of me playing Corn and Nurgle was actually quite fun. The Blood Flail is hilarious. <laughs> it hits on twos, unlike my Lord of Change. <laughs> you can make it. <laughs> you just need to find four, four warp store points. <laughs> then my Lord of Change can be as good at shooting as my Bloodthirster. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. We, we need to talk about the big one. This one's an easy one to fix, though. Obviously, we're talking flamers. These things are not balanced for their point cost. It's ridiculous. They are the same points they were in 8th edition. They gained so much damage output. I did not know that they were just 25 and 8th as well. They were two wounds back then. I am of the mind that no one had flamers in playtesting, which I believe is what happened with Drukari as well. We know Tabletop Tactics is one of the playtesters that GW likes getting feedback from, and we also know that they don't own Covens, my favorite part of Drukari, and they don't own Zinch. <laughs> and those are the two things that were busted in these codices. Yeah, it's one of those, like, this is an easy point fix. Like, we just increase their points. To explain this for people who don't follow competitive play to understand why this is such a problem, first, anecdotally, my first game this weekend was my Zinch game, the one that I wanted to play before I played my tax game, which was my, I need to have more info on the other parts of the codex. Yeah. I was like, let's get a quick one out of the way. We'll do a thousand point game and I'm going to have fun with this. Bring your nastiest list. Our Space Wolf player unfortunately brought a thousand points of Space Wolves. <laughs> I got first turn. I went a little fluffy. I only brought 11 flamers out of a possible 12. Had I brought the 12th flamer, I probably could have done slightly more. As it is, those 11 flamers on turn one removed 580 points of models. Nice. Out of a thousand. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. It, it honestly is. <laughs> so people understand what's happening in competitive right now. To give you, this will be two weeks ago for you when you hear this, a week ago for us. Last weekend... One of the winning lists was a quote-unquote Death Guard list. Hell yeah. <laughs> Death Guard can't soup Zinch Demons. They just flat out did the, we're not going to get our rules. I'm going to play my Death Guard without their army rule with Zinch as the second attachment. It's still legal because chaos. Yeah. The Zinch detachment, because you weren't getting army rules anyway, is a Zinch detachment and not a Zinch Demon detachment. They brought Aramon and a Fate Skimmer, I think, which gave them access to just a buttload of mortal wounds. And then they just did Max Flamers. The winning Iron Warriors list last weekend, 18 Flamers. Yep. If you're playing Chaos right now, 18 Flamers. It's basically the only way to really have a shot is to play Max Flamers. So that gets into the problem of I don't think points updates can solve everything in this book. 
No, it can't. It can't. I think they did a very good job when they fixed Necrons. Yeah. I don't think Necrons is that great right now. It's doing well in competitive because of a single build with really tuned secondaries. As soon as the secondaries get readjusted in Necrons, I have a feeling we're going to fall again. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just disappointing that this codex has some really interesting ideas. Yes, there are great ideas in here. All right, that does it for this very long look at a codex. We will be back next week with something very fun instead. Yeah, we've gotten this out of the way. This had to be done so that Brad could think about other things that are more fun. I can move on in life. Yeah. <laughs> next week will be very upbeat to make up for this please share with us your thoughts on this codex or other ones you think are runners up for worse codex and if you're a regular listening to this can you help us out a bit we're up to 500 subs on youtube which is a great start i'd really like us to hit a thousand so we can like fully unlock the youtube channel and get all the features doubling our count of subscribers is kind of rough i don't like saying like comment subscribe every video consider this like the one request to you guys to do that and if you're watching this on youtube make sure you're subscribed it could help us out all right that will do it for this week though let's get out of here sounds good